Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, let me begin. I don't know that we said Rebecca's name. So Rebecca Goldtree is who prayed for us this morning, and she is one of my urban fellows. So I'm excited to see her. So thank you, Rebecca. I uh, looked at this topic and they said, um, thinking about the big things, and I said, well, if we're going to think about big things, we should think about party poopers. I mean, it doesn't get much bigger than party poopers. Um, and I analyzed this Matthew text, and I know you're going to have some biblical scholars come later to talk about the text, so I thought about what sort of take would be helpful to think about. And what I decided to do was to sort of focus in on this part of the text. Um, so let me read it for you. Matthew 25, 34 through 36. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you called me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. I want to focus on I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. As I thought about this word invite, inviting the stranger that Jesus compels us to do, this is one of the main challenges, particularly for mainline denominations. Um, I can't speak for all denominations, but I can speak for United Methodists. Um, and there's a statistic that United Methodists, on average, invite someone to church about once every 13 years. <laughs> I mean, if you think about that, once every 13 years we invite someone to church. So we are challenged in inviting people to church. I think this gets even more complicated when you think about what if the stranger is not cooperative? What if they don't want to come when invited to church? And this is where I started thinking about uh, sort of the party analogy. Um, and this may only apply to me, but sometimes you get invited to an event and you're not really that excited about being invited to the event. You know, you got to get dressed up to go to the event. and you know you're going to go and the people at the event are going to be talking to other people so you're going to sort of be left to fend for yourself while you're there and you're thinking to yourself well how long do I have to be here can I escape early and get back home I mean all these things start running through your mind so you really become sort of a party pooper because you really don't want to be there to begin with and as I thought about this analogy of a party pooper I started thinking about our congregations, and in many ways in our congregations, we throw a celebration um, at least once a week where we are hoping people will come and join us for that celebration. And unfortunately, for many of us, there are those who think like we do when it comes to the party. They don't want to come to our celebration. They don't want to participate in our celebration. They basically are like, why would I want to go to that place? And if they do have to go, they're thinking, well, how long am I going to have to stay? And Lord, please let me get out of here early if I happen to have to go. Um, one of the things that we've done recently, and this is across mainline denominations, is we started new congregations. We have uh, Adam Burdell here who is doing a new church start. So we started new congregations. The challenge we have, though, is we can't start a new, enough new congregations to attract those individuals who I would call party poopers, that somehow we're going to have to figure out how do we revitalize existing congregations to connect with these individuals who are not coming. Um, so starting new congregations cannot be our only solution. So there's a, a disconnect that has taken place, and I believe this disconnect is particularly with those who are 35 and under. Um, I picked 35 because that's roughly the age people call for young adult. But we are disconnected from those 35 and under. The question is, how do we connect with those individuals? Um, those individuals who are 35 are the ones I'm calling the party poopers, those who don't want to participate in our congregations. So what is this disconnect? 
I think this disconnect is many of them don't understand why they should come to our celebration. They don't see the celebration in the same way that we do. They don't hold sort of the, the same love that we do, particularly for our congregations. And we don't understand why they don't have that same love. We're, we're sort of thinking, why don't you like what it is that we are doing? And in this way, I think they've almost become strangers to us, that they have become those who are sort of unfamiliar um, to us in many ways because they just don't seem connected to the way that we seem to be celebrating today. So in Matthew, we're called to invite the stranger. The question is, though, how do we invite those people who don't seem connected to us? Typically, when we think about a stranger, we usually think of someone who we don't know, someone who is not familiar to us. And one of the challenges, I would say, for why we don't invite strangers is many of us are fearful the stranger is going to reject us. So, you know, you don't want to go talk to someone who's going to reject you. You, you sort of shy away from that. Many of us don't want to push our beliefs on strangers. So we, we again, don't want to go talk to strangers. Uh, we shy away from that. So that we think of stranger as someone who's unfamiliar or somebody we don't know. It could be somebody in the metro you sit next to that you have no connection with. It could be the homeless person you have no connection with. But it's someone we don't know is a typical way we think about a stranger. <laughs> As I started looking at this text, I thought the word stranger may have a deeper meaning. So like all good people, I called my New Testament friend, our professor uh, of New Testament, or one of our professors of New Testament here, uh, Shively Smith. And I said, I'm looking at this word stranger, and it seems to have a different meaning than the way that we typically use it. And she agreed with uh, my thinking. She said that stranger in this case actually means someone who is different, someone who's different politically and someone who's different religiously. Um, so it's not that the person is unfamiliar to you, but they're different than you politically or religiously. And what Jesus is compelling them to do is to invite this person who they're familiar with, but that is different from them. And I said, that makes a lot of sense. And it sort of fits with some of the challenges that we have. If you think about someone who's politically estranged, could you imagine the Republicans trying to invite the Democrats to join them or the Democrats to invite the Republicans to join them and the challenge that you would have in making that happen? Um, our focus today is going to be sort of on the religiously estranged, that those who hold different values than we do, how do we invite those people to come and be a part of us? They're familiar, but in many ways, they're not so familiar to us. So this is the challenge that we have. The second piece of this that I thought was helpful is when we invite the stranger, it's an invitation to really become a part of the community. So you're not simply inviting somebody um, sort of for the purpose of them just being seen, but you're inviting them to become a part of who you are. And that's a real challenge if you think about not only must this stranger come and become a part of sort of sitting out there, but they have to become integral to the community. They have to sort of hold positions of power within the community, and that becomes more challenging for many of us with people who are under 35. So stranger in this case is someone who is different, and then when we invite them, we're saying we expect that they will become a part of the community, an integral part of the community, in the same way that we are part of the community. If you look at the Deuteronomy text, 1019, it says, you shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And, and this text sort of provides background for how Jesus is thinking about the word stranger. In this text, Jesus is reminding them that at one point in time, you were also religious strangers in Egypt, that you were different from those who were in Egypt, but you are still compelled to 
remember that and invite those who are non-religious and political strangers who are among you to become a part of who you are. Um, you can't forget where you came from. And I would argue that all of us in this room have been strangers at some point in time. And we are compelled by this text to think like Jesus that we need to invite those who are strangers to become a part of who we are. Then in Acts 15, 1 through 3, um, this text deals with the Judean council. It says, then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. So in this text, in Acts, they're willing to invite people to the community, but the second piece of it is the challenge. They don't want them to really become a part of the community. They're saying that there's these hurdles you have to jump over if you really, really want to become a part of us. Um, in this case, the tradition was circumcision. Our traditions are different, but we still have hurdles that we expect people to sort of jump over to really become a part of the community. So in this text, we find that people who come still don't really feel like they can completely integrate into the community. So we are challenged, one, not to forget that we all are strangers. And then when we do invite people to become a part of the community, we're challenged to really help them to really integrate into the community in a way that they feel like they're truly a part of what we're doing. So strangers today, I'm arguing that those under 35 are the party poopers. They're the strangers among us today. They're the individuals that are familiar to us in many ways, yet unfamiliar to us in many ways. If you read any of the recent sort of uh, data on this age group, more and more of them are becoming unaffiliated. Um, they are claiming no connection to any religious affiliation. And a part of this has to do, I believe, with they really feel that disconnected, um, particularly from mainline denominations. The question becomes then, if they are un this unaffiliated and they feel this tension between them and sort of what it is that we're trying to do with what I'm calling our celebration, our parties, how do we connect with them? How do we help them to sort of feel like they can really become a part of our communities? Um, this question is one that drives me um, and my research uh, deeply for, for what I'm doing. And what I want to do for just a few minutes this morning is um, sort of share some observations I believe are helpful in thinking about this question. Um, let me sort of, in sharing these observations, say a few things. First, what I'm sharing is not prescriptive. Um, these are sort of what I would call things to help us think deeper about this issue, to help us to sort of get behind some of the reasoning of why I think we're struggling to uh, connect with those who are under 35. Let me also say that what I'm trying to do is sort of talk about how they hold things together in ways that are uncomfortable for us to hold things together. And uh, I'll come back to that at the end, but sort of want to state that up front for, for where I'm headed. So the first of these that I want to share is sort of uh, what I call simple and complex. So I believe that those who are 35 and under hold together this notion of being simple yet complex. They're simple in that they're very straightforward and wanting to do things that they don't understand why it is I can't just start that ministry. Why is it that you have to have 10 meetings before you can start the ministry or do something? Why are the, all these roadblocks put in a way for what it is that I'm trying to accomplish? So they're, they're straightforward and simple and wanting to do things in that manner. But they're complex in that 
they don't want simple answers to the deeper <laughs> questions of faith, that they're thinking and searching for sort of deeper answers when it comes to the big questions about God and how this connects with their lives. I believe this is one of the reasons that the emergent conversation was attractive to so many young people, or in England, fresh expressions is attractive to young people because they're more willing to let people live with questions instead of trying to provide simple answers um, to those questions. Oftentimes, we want to provide simple answers instead of letting people live with the difficult questions that they're asking. So I would say they're simple yet complex. Second, I would say self-identity and community are critical for them. Self-identity and community. So they're still building a self-identity. They're, they're still discovering who they are um, in very important ways. They're doing this at the same time where they're very communal. Communal in the sense of, I like to use the word connectivity. Um, so they're, they're connected particularly through social media, um, small groups, and in other ways. And that connectivity <coughs> allows them to plug in when they want to, but not have to be plugged in when they don't want to be plugged in. So, so they're searching for self-identity. And they want to be connected, but they want to do it on their own terms. So there's a connectivity with them that helps them to live out this tension. That could, again, be challenging for us who sort of think about this in different ways. Traditional and non-traditional. Oftentimes, when we think of this age group, we think of them as being sort of uh, wanting everything new. Um, the reality is, is that in some ways they're very traditional. We uh, uh, took a group to Savannah, Georgia when I was at a, another school that I won't mention since we're in live streaming. <laughs> uh, we took a group to Savannah, Georgia. And there was an Episcopal church there that said that their most attended service was evening song. And those who came to evening song were 35 and under. Um, that they absolutely thought that that was the most rich experience for them was that particular service. And um, if any of you have ever experienced evening song, I mean, evening song is a very traditional worship experience. I mean, there's nothing new about evening song. So we make a mistake when we think they're just simply seeking new things. So very traditional in the sense that, again, it relates to deeper spirituality. They are, however, I believe, non-traditional in the sense that they're not beholden to doing things just because we've always done it that way. Um, so just because we've always held the church picnic on the third Saturday in June <laughs> doesn't mean we always have to hold the church picnic on the third Saturday in June. Um, so they're non-traditional in that they're willing to break out of the mold of some of these things that we get trapped in that we create as traditions because we've always done it that way. So traditional sort of in seeking spirituality, but non-traditional in that they're willing to break away from the mold of some of these things that we create as traditions in our congregations. I believe that they're involved in non-committed. And by this, I mean those under 35 are committed to missional work. Um, they're committed to that sort of activism where they are engaging the disadvantaged. So Habitat for Humanity, working with the homeless, and these other sort of missional issues are critically important for them. And they are committed to doing that sort of work that gets them out of the walls of the congregation. I believe they're non-committed in that they don't like sort of the institutional self sort of centeredness that we often find with our congregations. So that congregations that are thinking about simply trying to take care of their buildings and keep the doors open, they shy away from that. So they're not committed to just 
simply keeping the church going because the building has been there for 200 years, but they are committed to getting outside and connecting with those who are disadvantaged in the community. Um, this could be particularly challenging for many of us who love our church buildings and <laughs> congregations because we have committed a lot of resources to keeping these buildings open and going and moving forward. They're open and closed. Um, this one is also challenging. We took a um, vacation to Hawaii this summer, and a young man who was our tour guide um, was having a conversation, and he talked about how he was Christian, Buddhist, and Islam all at the same time. <laughs> Um, and he was very serious. I mean, I'm not, I mean, you know, that he, he, he perceived that he could pull what he felt were like the best of all of these traditions to help shape him in a positive and a good way. So he was open to doing that because he thought that would help him to become a better person. They're closed in the sense that they don't want to accept limitations on their faith. Um, they don't want us to put limitations on who they can be um, in terms of their faith. They feel like they are able to hold together, as difficult as it may sound, that I can be Buddhist, Christian, and Islam, and explore all of those things at the same time. Um, and you shouldn't limit me if I think that's what I can do. So they're both open and closed in ways that sometimes can be challenging for us to think about in the way that we hold things together. They're interdependent and independent. Interdependent and independent. By interdependent, people, many who are under 35 feel that collaborative work is critically important. Um, they're not as hierarchical uh, as many of our mainline denominations tend to be. They're sort of more flat line in the way that they perceive the world. So that they're seeking to be able to work together and collaborate together to make things happen. Um, it's not so much pointing to one leader, but it's about what can we get done together um, in trying to make something happen. They're independent, however, in sort of seeking to break away from norms. Um, and by this is, Again, if you look at many of the data, those who are under 35 are as likely to go and work for a nonprofit or to start a nonprofit as they are to take a corporate job that would pay a lot more money. Um, so they're breaking away from sort of the norm or expectation of what we would see as the trajectory of what you should do in society. You go to college, you get a good paying job, and that's the way you progress through life. So they're, they're breaking out of that mold in the way that they perceive the world. So in this sort of sense, they're interdependent but independent in the way that they're thinking about how it is that they move forward. And finally, they're uh, global and local. And by global and local, they have a global awareness that uh, some of us in this room um, were not able to grow up with unless we were able to travel extensively. But just because of today with access through the internet and other social media, there's a different global awareness that is possible that wasn't possible when many of us were growing up. But at the same time, many of them support local farmers and local causes and local efforts. So there's this global awareness going on. At the same time, they want to support very local efforts that are taking place right there in the community. Um, so that, again, they're holding sort of these two things together at the same time. So I'm going to talk about what I think this means um, in a couple of different ways. And then um, I'll stop there and open it up for a conversation with all of you. So I think what this means is that those of us who are in the church at times 
struggle with the way that I have expressed here that I think those under 35 or some under 35 sort of hold things together. That our tendency is to be more mutually exclusive, that we're sort of, you're going to do either this or you're going to do that, but you're not going to sort of hold the tension of both of these things together. So it's a challenge for us to connect with them because we aren't able to hold those things together in the same way that many of them are able to hold these things together. We like to resolve the tension. We want to sort of give an answer and make something happen and move forward instead of sort of living with that tension. Living with the tension is challenging for many of us. How do, we, how do strangers perceive our invitations? You know, going back to inviting strangers, you know, part of the question is how do they perceive the invitation? Is it a genuine invitation? Are we inviting them really to become a part of the community or are we simply sort of inviting them and saying you can be seen in this community but not heard in this community? That you really have no voice in what will take place. Um, so we have to ask ourselves, are we being genuine in what we're doing in terms of the invitation or are we simply trying to get them to continue what it is that we have already constructed um, is sort of the underneath question. So I think we have to rethink our understanding of stranger. That in this text, that stranger really points us to those who are religiously different than us. And, and today I'm arguing one of those individuals or one of those groups are those who are under 35 who are religiously different than us. And that we have to start thinking of how is it that we can alter some of the things we do to connect with those who are familiar yet unfamiliar to us. We have to rethink our understanding of hospitality. Um, hospitality for many of us almost becomes more entertainment-like than it does genuinely inviting them to become an integral part of who we are. Um, we think if we're really nice to people and we smile at them and give them a bulletin that we've done our part for hospitality. But, you know, have we really made space for them to take up leadership in the congregation? Have we made space for their voices to be heard in our congregations? Or is the expectation that you know you leave all the big decisions to those of us who are already there and your time will come 25 30 years from now <laughs> when you can sort of move into power we have to evaluate our willingness to live with these tensions some of these tensions are difficult for us to think about holding together um, and certainly not all of these tensions are going to apply to every single young person. But if the data is correct, we have to think about how do we live in this both and world and not sort of this either or world that many of our congregations have lived in for years. So how do we connect with those who may not think the way we do, who are very different from us, yet we do really want them not to be party poopers and we want them to uh, come be a part of what we are doing. So we have to be able to think about how do we help people to live with these tensions. And finally, an unabashed advertisement. <laughs> Coming this January, um, new book, Not Safe for Church, uh, Ten Commandments for Reaching Younger Generations. I uh, co-authored with uh, Jasmine Smothers, who uh, some of you who are United Methodists know her father, Rodney Smothers. Um, so in the book, we talk about sort of some very practical things for connecting with younger generations. So today I tried to provide sort of a backdrop of the thinking that sort of goes into that. But this will be available January 6th. You can pre-order it now on Amazon.com. <laughs> okay, you can go out there right now and pre-order the book. I want you to know that. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop there. Oh, yeah, before. absolutely. I'm going to sort of warm us up with a question. All right. Um, given the, the uh, advice
advice you have about being present with these strangers yeah. and thinking about the local church as we often encounter it today, I'm wondering, where does this conversation start in the average local church these days? So the question is, where does the conversation start for sort of uh, engaging the strangers as I have defined it? I think a couple of places. Um, one is we have to be honest about who we are um, as a congregation. And that could be very challenging. Um, it seems like a simple thing, but, but oftentimes the way we see ourselves is very different from how others perceive us. Um, and sometimes you actually have to go out and sort of ask, sort of how are we perceived by others so that we can really be honest about who we are. So, so coming to an awareness of who we are as a congregation and how others perceive us, I think, is critically important. The second thing, then, I think that is critically important, then, is really actually inviting um, individuals who are not a part of the congregation to be in conversation with us about why it is that they don't believe we're extending a genuine invitation to them to become a part of who we are. Um, and again, that can be hard to sort of get that sort of honest feedback of why it is that they feel they're disconnected from who we are as a congregation. So I would start with those two things. Oh, great, thank you. Yes, sir. One of the parts that's difficult for me to understand is, is the notion of stranger being people who are different than we are. Yeah. <laughs> And that's based on basically what I see when I go to churches, and I visit a variety of churches. And most of the people I see in the churches, whether they're a new church that's almost exclusively under 35, or a well-established church that's almost exclusively over 65, is they're not different. That is, this congregation is all 35 and under, and this congregation is all 55 and over. Yeah. And uh, this congregation is all Latino. This congregation is all Ethiopian. You know, this. And so congregations, to me, it seems like, are not by nature inviting to people who are different. Yeah. Uh, that, 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 that they're alike. And, and that yeah. seems to be what's attractive. Uh, I happen to be in the Arlington area, and there's a bunch of new young yeah. startup churches. One of them by a Wesley graduate. You go there, they all look the same. Yeah. A couple of responses. The question was sort of congregations look the same and they aren't really that different. Um, and I'm going to agree with you. I'm going to begin by agreeing with you and say yes. I mean, that is the case. And that's part of the reason when I, if you go back to sort of the beginning of the presentation, I talked about that one of the things that many mainline denominations are doing is starting new congregations because they start them because they're trying to attract basically those who are similar um, to the individual that they have planted to do so. Um, so. So absolutely correct. I mean, that's sort of been the main approach. I think, however, that we're not going to be able to start enough new congregations <clears throat> that are going to sort of change the wave or where we're headed in terms of mainline decline um, in that sense. So that we're going to have to think outside of the box about what it means to revitalize current congregations. And so this is where sort of my push for thinking about different comes in. Um, so those individuals who are attracted to the same thing are, are going to go I mean, you're not going to change. And if someone who wants to be with someone who's under 35 or someone who wants to be with someone who's over 55, that's going to happen. But I believe there are those individuals um, that are intergenerational, um, that are seeking difference, and are attracted to uh, doing something new. The challenge has been, I'm not certain we've done well at engaging in that conversation, going back to the first sort of question, that our approach always has been, let's just try to keep attracting those who are exactly like us, because it's easier work than having to do the hard work of thinking about, well, how do we really engage those individuals who are different from us, um, and invite them to become a part of who we are. 
I think there's a couple of reasons why we don't want to do that. Number one is it could change who we are. So if, if I truly invite someone who's different, it may mean I may have to do some different things than what I was doing. Um, and Don's truth is most of us don't like to do something different. I mean, we want to, you know, part of the reason we're doing something is we like it the way it is. So we don't want to, we don't want to have to change. So I think that that's uh, a, a big challenge. And I don't, I think that's a hurdle when I don't say that lightly. I think the second piece of it um, that is important is that we have fallen into this uh, trap of thinking that at some point in time, those who are under 35 are going to come back into the church. That the, the pattern is, is that they go away, they're going to have children, they'll come back into the church. Um, that's going to be true to a certain extent, but I don't know that's going to be true in the same way that it has been in the past. So that if we don't start now thinking about doing things differently, that we could be in more trouble um, in 10 or 15 years from now if we, if we don't take this seriously. Yeah. Here, go ahead. Okay, yes. One of the challenging things we have in our church is that we're realizing that our students that are going, uh, go away to college and come back, and they're about 23 to 25, yeah. and they have been raised in a church in traditional programs like the church choir, the Boy Scouts, ushers, and things like that. Some of them get really overwhelmed because once they come back and return to the community, the same leaders will approach them to say, let's take on this leadership role and let's train you, know, train you mm -hmm. to help other young people. And like you have stated in your presentation, a lot of them don't want the commitment of every Sunday. Um, and I'll share with you, I have a son that's 23, he has returned back to the community, and he's been approached to do Sunday school, this. But what he opted to do was to affiliate himself with HBCUs and help students in the city and do various workshops right. yeah. that are planned like every three months. That's right. And he said, Mom, I'm just returning, and I don't want to be overwhelmed or committed at yeah. this time. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we approach and keep those young people and find something within the church to keep them still active until they decide what ministry they want to take on or create a new ministry for the church. Yeah. Um, that is a long question to repeat. Uh, so I think the question there is how do we engage those who are coming back to the church? I, and I think a couple of things, and I think you actually answered your own question in, um, in some ways, is, is that many times they almost feel like they're uh, being attacked by vultures, that everybody, uh, when you, you know, because we don't have as many people, young people returning, everybody yeah. sort of grabs them at the same time and wants them to, to do something. So I think what we have to do is become um, aware that, of course, they are just often starting off on their career paths and their time is going to be limited. And while they certainly want to be a part of the congregation, that we have to make space for them to think about where they think their gifts can best be shared in doing that work. Um, so again, it's a conversation of letting them say, I think my gifts can best be used here in doing this sort of work, um, and letting them make that decision instead of everybody sort of attacking and saying, we need you here, we need you here, we need you here. So sort of flipping it. Yeah, and, and allowing them to make that decision. Um, the other thing I think is important is making sure that we're supporting them um, while they do the work. You know, oftentimes in congregations, we always talk about supporting um, younger people, but when they do come up with a new idea and want to do something different, you know, if it doesn't take off in a way that we think it should take off, you know, immediately people start just saying, well, I told you that wasn't going to work, or, you know, I knew that was a horrible. So, I mean, they become very discouraged very quickly when they don't feel like there's support that is coming from those who are part of the congregation. So I think also making sure we actually are supporting their efforts. I mean, everything that we have done for years did not work, um, you know, and we have to remember that. So again, we got to remember, we, we forget sometimes that 
we've had failures also, so, you know, but supporting them in that effort. Yes? Doug, so all of this is taking place in, in what is now, perhaps in oversimplified terms, but if we're in an either or culture, yeah. and we're talking, you're talking about the need for a both and church, yeah. or both and Christianity. Yeah. Uh, and this, doing this in the context of the culture, I mean, if you go back to Niebuhr's work on Christ and culture, yeah. uh, where are we? Um, it's a good question. Well, there were a couple of questions in there. He threw in Niebuhr, which is always good. <laughs> and a uh, question on culture of where we are in terms of uh, that we live in an either or culture. And, and how I think a couple of things in that. One is I think that our culture is becoming more divided in that sense. And, and without trying to become too technical, this is where I think um, those who are arguing for postmodernity actually do have somewhat of a point that we see individuals who claim to be postmodern who really are more both and than either or. So you have sort of a clash of cultures um, to a certain extent. Those who are holding on to this sort of either or, I want to resolve everything, with those who are saying, no, I want to sit with the tension, I don't want to resolve everything. Um, and that you have both of these cultures sort of running alongside of each other at the same time. Um, in that sense, sort of going to the second part of what you talked about with Niebuhr, I mean, cer certainly Niebuhr, when he was writing, was writing in an either-or culture. So he, he really didn't experience what I'm calling this sort of clash of culture, so a sort of an unfair question in terms of how he would think about this. Um, I think to a certain extent that it's reclaiming some of the ancient practices um, and that he would certainly see that, that where people were able to hold things together that we don't do as well today in the culture. Um, the question for me, which you may be asking but I didn't hear you ask completely, is you know, where does this head? Where do we end up with this sort of clash of culture as I'm talking about it? The truth is, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't think that um, we ever are going to come, become completely postmodern in a way that some people are predicting. But I do, I do think that we are going to see a shift to where there is more both and thinking than that we are currently seeing um, as the years go by because more people are willing to live with that tension than previously had before. So our congregations, to a certain extent, are going to have to catch up to that sort of shift that is taking place in that sense. Are all our congregations going to do that? No. Uh, but hopefully we will have enough congregations that are willing to sort of understand that there is a shift taking place in the culture that is critically important. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Look. <laughs> I'm, a Gen, I'm a Gen X observation. Mm -hmm. Um, I noticed your lists were very consistent <laughs> from um, simple and complex to self identity to um, involved and non committal to non traditional, but yet seeking traditional. I mean, we are just a confused bunch, <laughs> but yet we do know what we want. I mean, we want that ability to have freedom to go between these different flow of things that you listed. Yeah. And, um, but I also thought about, I'm also a parent, so unlikely than most of my generation, but I was thinking in my head, I said, this sounds like my five-year-old daughter when she was five years old, you know? And, and I looked at the room and I observed that most of you parents are either um, baby boomers that I noticed here, so I noticed that this tension you were talking about is between our parents and us, right? Somewhere along the way in our families, we raised these wonderful great kids like us, but we are so different, and this creates this tension. So biblically, I started thinking about what you said about community and radical hospitality. And I think um, the phrase that came to mind, I want to go somewhere with my question, is an African proverb that says, a family tree can bend, but it doesn't break. Mm -hmm. And that proverb leads me to what I want to ask is, how do we, in church communities then, create this space where this bond of family that is centered on Christ Christianity, which is Jesus Christ, holds us. So how do we, because I find that 
even in my disillusionment with religion, religious institution, I love tradition and religion mm -hmm. in terms of Christianity. I love Jesus, yeah. you know? I love Jesus, but I want to be in a space where I can love Jesus and have all those listed things you say yeah. and have my community of my parents and their other communities of people around me. So how do you um, have that kind of radical hospitality that allows all of those things to exist in what you call the tension? Yeah. There is no way I could repeat that. <laughs> Just want to point that out. But I will try to answer. Um, I think a couple of things. One is, as I said in the beginning, certainly this is not going to be true for every young person. So I want to, I want to make that clear. Uh, and the second is that, and I said this earlier also, that I think one of the challenges we had, I'm starting sort of with the generational point that you made. One of the challenges we have now is there's always been sort of an assumption and it's worked out is that as we raise our children, they may move away um, from the church, but they're always going to come back to the church. Um, I think that the challenge with that notion today is that because the non-affiliated group is growing in the fastest actually growing category, not as many of them ever have been connected to the church to begin with. Yeah. Um, so they're not going to come back to the church in the ways that they have in the past. So, so that is part of, of what I am arguing is one of the, the unique challenges we face in moving forward. So then going to your question, we have to start thinking about how do we open ourselves up to truly having a conversation, engaging those who may have no understanding um, of the faith or the tradition. Um, the assumption has always been that people sort of know what Christianity is. They sort of know what church is. But the truth is we can't make those assumptions anymore, that we have to really start understanding. There are individuals who really have no clue um, when we're using this language, what we mean by that language. Um, what they are clearer on is sort of relationship. And we got to build that relationship with them in terms of that they believe that we are invested for the right reasons and we're investing in them for the right reasons. And I think that's what we have to do better is that, that investment, uh, particularly in them for the right reasons. Um, and that's part of what I was trying to share. We sometimes invest because we simply are trying to get them to continue to keep our building operating. That's not investing for the right reason. We have to invest in them because, to use your language, we truly believe that we're helping them to deepen that relationship with Christ. Um, and that that's meaningful and for how they will their, live their lives. So we, we have to make the investment for the right reason. It can't be self-centered around what we want, but an investment that <coughs> truly is perceived as a gift for them being able to move forward. Uh, I was just thinking that since now I'm well retired, uh, that I sound more like in the category of the under 35 group. Yeah. <laughs> I don't sound, you know, yeah. So I yeah. just wanted to make that observation. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Many in the room will feel the same way that we all want to be tied down to right. the same church, the same kinds of things. Yeah. So uh, I, we may be in that, we, there may be a new generation that coming yeah. for those after 65. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, um, and that's absolutely true, that any time you do this and make categories, it's always uh, challenging because categories never perfectly fit everyone. So I, I would agree 100%. I was interested in what you said about uh, the under 35s being interested in traditional forms of worship, yeah. and you gave the example of even song as whether that was because it's not 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. <laughs> I'm not sure how big a factor that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, it seems that a lot of our churches, in, in an attempt to attract the, the younger crowd, uh, are sort of moving towards more popular kinds of worship styles. And you didn't really mention that, but uh, there seems to be an assumption that more casual worship styles and so on is what would attract the, the younger group. And you seem to be contradicting that. 
Yeah, I don't want to use the word contradictory. What, I, what I'm hoping I'm saying is we shouldn't just simply make that assumption. Um, I think that that's part of what gets us in trouble is that we, as congregations, what we do is we say, well, what should we do to attract younger people? So we come up with this idea, so we'll start this. Um, but we've had no conversation with the individuals we're hoping will come to the service in many cases. We just do it ourselves. Um, and we're making, I think, an unfair assumption that they're throwing out tradition, which um, is, I don't think, a fair assumption, because many of them actually do really appreciate the tradition, is, is that you know, oftentimes we aren't helping them to connect to the tradition in a way that is meaningful for them. So, so my suggestion is we're getting stuck on sort of contemporary, which I'm not sure what that means because depending on when you're born, is contemporary. You, you throw out the order. Yeah, yeah, you know. Uh, so, so I think we should shy away from that and think more in terms of how do we help people to really experience God in a meaningful way. Um, however that looks in a worship experience, I think is the more important question than we do this certain type of music or this certain type of thing. Because certainly there will be people who like classical, there will be people who like whatever we call contemporary, all the way to people who like hip hop. I mean, all these, I think all these things are possible, but we shouldn't just pigeonhole people um, into one category is what I'm arguing. This gentleman's been trying to get in. Thank you, sir. Jack Lee. Um, uh, an anecdote and then a scriptural observation. Uh -huh. I lived in Memphis, Tennessee in the late 80s, and uh, the weatherman on Saturday night would come on and say, uh, you all want to remember to take your umbrella with you on Sunday because it's going to rain on your way to church. <laughs> now, it probably still rains in Memphis. They yeah. probably still have weather forecasts. Yeah. And umbrellas are probably still used. Yeah. But whether they're all tied together and mentioned in that way, I wonder. Yeah. I don't know. So that, that's a cultural observation, and maybe even a regional cultural observation. Mm -hmm. The scripture is John chapter 4, where Jesus encounters the woman at the well. Now, I don't know if she's under 35 or not, yeah. mm -hmm. but she certainly is a stranger, yeah. and he certainly is in a position to tell her that she's lost and needs to be in the lifeboat. Right. Or to say, there's room in the lifeboat next to me. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that that's the path he chooses, and the hook he uses, of course, is the water yeah. as the symbol. Yeah. But she was as different from him as night is from day. Yeah. In fact, that's why they met in the middle of the day, yeah. because she was ashamed to come when all the other women came. Yeah. <clears throat> what I, and I want to follow up with what you said. I thought was great is that in order for the church to be transformed, the people in the church have to be willing to be transformed, mm -hmm. to be risk seekers, yeah. and not risk averse. Yeah. And I, I'll tell you, when I was in college, I went around looking for churches. This is a little bit of a soliloquy, so I apologize. I don't expect you to rephrase it or paraphrase it. But <laughs> I went to a church, and the, it was a Methodist church, and a, a great older woman came by with some fresh bread and a coffee mug. Well, I ate the, the bread right away, and I still have the mug. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't go back. Then I went to a Mennonite church, and the people there were really of meager substance. Yeah. And one of them, who had like five kids, invited me to his house after dinner. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that church and that family, yeah. and it's like 40, 35 years Easily. ago. Yeah. And, and so I, I think you know, what you said is, and I, I'm sorry I don't know your name, but I think that's where we have to live. Right. And we have to do it in a way like Jesus did at the well that says, hey, there's plenty of room in the lifeboat here with me. Yeah. Rather than saying, you're lost, and you need to get in the lifeboat. And unfortunately, too often, churches come across in that kind of format where it's a judgmental, critical observation rather than a communal, come and be part of what we have. And, and you will be enriched, and we will be enriched because you're with us. So I don't know how you respond to all that, but you know, this has been very fruitful for me. I mean, my mind has been spinning. I'm not sure it was a great coffee, Terry, <laughs> uh, or the, or the eggs, but I mean, you really have churned up a lot of stuff in me, and, yeah. and, and I apologize for taking so much time right. to kind of unpack this, but yeah. and I'm thinking, i got to sign up for this book. Yeah, <laughs> yes, good. I'm not on staff here. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, this is a real quick response, is that I think what you pointed to 
was the investment that family made in you. Um, and that investment you perceived as critically important given their means. And, and that's really sort of the response I was giving over here is that, you know, what you saw was them not being self-absorbed and being concerned about sort of their own thing, but they invested in you and willing to say, we may not have a lot, but we want to share it with you. I yeah. was a college student, probably yeah. on par or less than that. Yeah. And the fact is, they didn't say, come and join our church and help us fix this That's right. Thing the next That's right. They said, come and enjoy yeah. our fellowship That's right. and be part of our African tree. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I say. So investment was critical. All right. I saw a hand over here. I don't know how many more I have. <laughs> One more. I saw a hand over here. Um, I, my, I want to go back to the, the tour guide. Yeah, yeah. If we're going to be radically um, hospitable, how the, my, and I'm serving a church now that is this way. Um, and my, I, you know, I come from pretty traditional preaching. And so holding intention being welcoming to everyone and, and yet maintaining that Christian distinctive. How do you know, got any thoughts on that? <laughs> and it's also going to be in Kindle. Yes, it is in Kindle. Yeah, you can order. Pre-order Amazon. Yeah, it's there in Kindle. <laughs> um, I, it, I'm, I'm just going to be, I mean, I think that it's a challenging question. I mean, of all the ones that I share, that's probably the most challenging for me because I'm interested in the Christian distinctive also. And, and their ability to hold that tension of all these things together um, sometimes is hard for me to think about. But the way that I do think about it is this, is, is, is that oftentimes we just immediately want to say no you got to see it in this way instead of thinking about the importance of the conversation and the dialogue um, as they go through that sort of self-discovery. So my, I think for me what is critically important is sort of being willing to actually have that dialogue and that conversation as people go through the self-discovery and not immediately pushing to it's got to be done from sort of this one way of, of, of seeing things because if, if we say no immediately, we're certainly not going to help, and uh, they're not going to be open to having a conversation with us. Yeah, yeah so that we, we have to sort of be willing to, to enter into honest dialogue and sort of allow that exploration that is critical to them. Um, but I would agree with you. I think that is, that is probably, at least for me, the most and challenging. When you consider that, you, that we get a lot of them only for that one hour, yeah. and that's kind of the Christian hour. Yeah. It's just as, uh, you know, um, challenging. It's not only challenging, it's, it hurts my heart somehow yeah. that, that you can't, you know, you can't go you, you yeah. on, at 11 o'clock. Yeah. Or I don't want to go you, you at 11 o'clock. Yeah. So, anyway. Yeah. Well, thank you all. I have enjoyed it, and I appreciate it.